Well, today, I have some questions for God. God, where were you when Hitler killed six million helpless Jews? God, where were you when that Cleveland man snatched three girls off the street? Where were you when he was abusing and raping them for 10 years? Where are you now, God? Where are you when our judges and justice system call good evil and call evil good? Where are you when swindlers cheat senior citizens out of their life savings? Where are you when more than a million babies are killed in their mother's womb every year? Where are you while Christians in China, Korea, India, and the Middle East are being imprisoned? Where are you when so many are dying simply because they love you? Where are you, God, when we pray for the salvation of our parents, our children, our friends, and nothing happens? Are you there, God? Are you listening? Do you even care? When are you going to answer me When are you going to do something? When are you going to act? Do I have the right to ask such questions of God? Do you have the right? Well, it depends. It depends on why you're asking those questions and the attitude with which you ask. What I do know is this. In the Old Testament book of Habakkuk, we meet a man who asks God the same kind of questions I just asked here today. You want to know how God responds? If you have a Bible, turn with me to Habakkuk. The little book of Habakkuk in what we call the Minor Prophets. Habakkuk follows the book of Nahum, which may not help you because that's only two pages itself. (laughs) If you find Micah, go through Nahum and then you'll come to Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Habakkuk 1, verses 2 through 4. Now the prophet Habakkuk, he lived in a day much like our day. Crime in his nation, violence were skyrocketing. National leaders and judges were becoming more and more corrupt. The poor were being victimized. The threat of war hung heavy in the air. And knowing that God is holy and just, Habakkuk could not understand how God could just turn and look the other way. But from the prophet's perspective, that's exactly what God was doing. Turning away, looking away, with all the sin that seemed to not be dealt with at all. And Habakkuk wanted to know why. With that in mind, follow as I read Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Habakkuk speaks and says, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see inequity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. Habakkuk doesn't mince words, does he? Habakkuk knows that he serves a holy God. But when he looks around... What he sees is evil winning while God stands passively by. And it's more than he can take. And so he cries out, why aren't you doing something, God? Answer me now, God. And as I read these words, 
I half expect a lightning bolt to come out of the sky and make Habakkuk a little greasy spot on the pavement. But amazingly, the lightning bolt does not come. Instead, God actually answers Habakkuk. He answers him. God reveals his plan. God reveals that, in fact, judgment is coming to Israel. God's holiness will, in fact, be satisfied. God's justice will be done. And that's what God tells Habakkuk in verses 5 through 11. Look again, Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. God says to Habakkuk, Look among the nations and see, wonder, and be astonished. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe it told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that is the Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. And then they sweep by like the wind and go on, guilty men whose own might is their God. And so the, to the prophet, the prophet who has just challenged God, God answers, Habakkuk, don't misunderstand me. Don't misinterpret my patience with Israel as laxity towards sin. Because Habakkuk, the judgment you demand is in fact coming. Judah and Jerusalem will be punished for their sin. And if it's judgment you want, Habakkuk, it's judgment you're going to get. I'm bringing the Babylonians against Judah to execute my wrath. And when the Babylonians come, they won't show mercy. They won't hold back. The people of Judah will be slaughtered. The city of Jerusalem will be turned into a smoking heap. Are you happy now, Habakkuk? Are you satisfied that I've got a plan? Well, as it turns out, Habakkuk wasn't satisfied with God's plan. The prophet cries out to God a second time in Habakkuk 1, verses 12 through 13, to this promise that the Babylonians were coming to execute wrath against Israel. Habakkuk responds, verse 12, uh, God, are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them, the Babylonians, as a judgment. And you, O rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and are silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he. Do you understand Habakkuk's complaint here? His confusion? He complains to God first about how the sins of Judah are going unpunished and justice is not being done in Jerusalem. And then God answers him, relax, Habakkuk. Because I am going to punish your corrupt society. I will judge them. And I am going to use the Babylonians to do it. But rather than satisfy Habakkuk, 
That answer now leaves him even more confused. You see, as sinful as the Israelites were, the Babylonians were more sinful still. The Babylonians were more proud than Judah. The Babylonians were more violent, more sadistic than the Israelites had ever thought to be. And using the Babylonians to judge Israel would be comparable to God letting Hitler win World War II as a means of punishing America for her sins. And so Habakkuk asked God, how can that be right? How can that be right? How can that be just? And so in verse 13, the prophet asks, why are you silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Because as wicked as we are, they're worse. How can that be? And so in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1, we find the prophet once again waiting for God to give him an answer. Habakkuk 2.1, he declares, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he, what God will say to me. How often do we ask God the questions we really have? And then say, Lord, I'm going to wait for you to answer. Well, mercifully, God does answer Habakkuk, or he might still be standing there today. And in his answer, in God's answer, we find one of the most important and profound statements in the Bible. And it is tragic that these words, this answer from God, lie hidden to so many professing Christians who choose to ignore this book and the minor prophets as a whole. Listen to the words of God to the prophet Habakkuk, and in fact his word to all who struggle with the presence of evil in our world. Habakkuk chapter 2 Verses 2 through 4. Again, Habakkuk says, And the Lord answered me. The Lord answered me. Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie if it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold his soul, that is Babylon's soul. Behold his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous, the righteous shall live by his faith. So what is this vision that God speaks of? This vision that awaits its appointed time. For what does God tell Habakkuk he needs to wait? Well, the answer is found in the rest of chapter 2. We won't read it, but Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 6 through 20. God announces that a day is coming when he will give Babylon her due. Because of Babylon's ruthless destruction of Israel, God promises that Babylon's violence will not go unpunished, that her arrogance will not escape God's wrath. God promises Habakkuk that the day of Babylon's reckoning it was already marked on God's calendar. And to Habakkuk and to the people of Israel, God promised. When that day arrived, the day of reckoning for Babylon, on that day, but not until that day, the destroyer of Judah would also be destroyed. 
That was his promise. So let's make sure we're all together on this. Let's, let's review a minute. The book of, book of Habakkuk opens with a prophet in distress. He lives in a nation where violence, where injustice are on the rise. Religious leaders, religious authorities, governing authorities are becoming more and more corrupt. And so he asks God, why aren't you doing anything about the sin of my nation? Where's your righteousness, God? Where's your justice? And to that question, God answers, well, Habakkuk, I will judge Judah. I will judge your nation for her sin. And let me tell you how I'm going to do it. I'm going to bring the evil Babylonians to wipe your nation out. And to that, Habakkuk responds, Lord, that can't be right. The Babylonians, they're more wicked than we are. That's just not fair. It's not fair. To which God answers, trust me, Habakkuk. No matter how bad it gets, and it will get bad, trust me. Trust me because after I use the Babylonians to judge your nation, I promise you, I will also judge them. And that brings us to one of the most significant verses in the Bible. When it comes to knowing what it means to be right with God, what it means to live for God, you will not find one single verse of Scripture in the Bible more significant than Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Habakkuk 2.4 is God's call to faith. God's call to faith no matter what your circumstances might be. Habakkuk 2.4 is God's call to stake your whole life and even your eternity on the promises that he makes in Scripture. In Habakkuk 2.4, God says, Behold his soul, Babylon, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not right within him. But the righteous, the righteous shall live by his faith, by her faith. And so here God reminds the prophet, and he reminds you and me, that there are really only two kinds of people in this world. There are puffed up people like the Babylonians who trust in themselves and who live for themselves. And by doing so, they bring judgment upon themselves. And second, God reminds us there are people who live by faith in God and live by faith in His promises and by doing so, become righteous in his sight. Which kind of person are you? Are you a man? Are you a woman whose soul is puffed up? Do you believe in yourself? Do you live for yourself? Have you made yourself the ultimate judge of what's right and what's wrong? Are you trying to make yourself worthy in other words, are you trying to be your own savior? That also is a form, and perhaps the worst form, of pride. Trying to be your own savior. Or are you a righteous man? Are you a righteous woman who lives day by day by your faith? So what's it mean to live by faith? Habakkuk 2, verse 2, reminds us that the essence of faith is to believe God's promises. And the place we find God's promises is His written word. In Habakkuk 2, verse 2, God tells the prophet, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who does what? Reads it. Reads it. 
Habakkuk did write the vision. And you know that's what we're reading today, right here, right now. The Bible is God's word given to us through the Old Testament prophets and through the New Testament apostles. And in God's word, in the Bible, we find the promises of God. And the ultimate promise that God makes in the Bible is that Jesus, who is God become man, died on a cross to pay the full penalty for our sins and rose from the grave so that we could share eternal life with him by grace alone, through faith alone. The question is, do you believe God's word? Do you believe his promise of forgiveness of sins and eternal life through faith in Jesus? In Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Romans 1, 16 and 17, do you know that Paul quotes this very passage in Habakkuk and relates it specifically to the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good news of Christ. And he quotes this verse from Habakkuk. Romans 1, 16 and 17, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news. I'm not ashamed of it. For it is, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. A second time Paul quotes Habakkuk 2 verse 4 is in Galatians chapter 3 verse 11. Again, in relation to the gospel that Jesus Christ died on a cross, paid our penalties, and that we are saved not by works but by grace. In Galatians 3.11, the Apostle Paul again quotes this verse when he says, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by what? By faith. By faith. It's the gospel. So are you righteous? Are you living by your faith? Do you know God's written word? Do you believe the promises that are found in his word? And have you put your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you when he died on the cross and when he rose from the grave? Because the righteous shall live by his or her faith. It's the only way you can live. Because that's true, we need to know what faith is. And faith begins and is rooted in believing in the promises of God. Faith is believing in the promises of God. And when we truly believe in God's promises, Habakkuk reminds us that faith expresses itself by patiently waiting for God's final salvation and final justice to come. Faith expresses itself through patient waiting for the justice of God. Again, Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And the Lord answered me, write the vision and make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, does God ever seem slow to you? Does promises ever seem slow to you? If it seems slow, wait for it. 
Wait for it. Because it will surely come. And it will not delay. How do you react when life doesn't work out the way you planned it and the promises of God don't seem like they're being fulfilled? How do you respond in those times? How do you respond when you read in the newspaper about children being raped, dictators gassing their own citizens, terrorists randomly blowing people apart on the streets? At the beginning of the sermon, I asked some difficult questions. Where was God when Hitler was killing six million Jews? Where was God when those children in Cleveland were being raped for 10 solid years? Where is God today when children are being sold into slavery all around the world? Where is God today when followers of Christ are being tortured and killed? Why doesn't God do something? Why doesn't he do it now? And these are the kinds of questions that God himself answers for us in this book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3 God says to you and me, when we don't understand, the vision awaits its appointed time. It, that is the justice of God. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. Wait for it. It will surely come. It's coming. It will not delay. Do we understand what God is saying, not just to Habakkuk, but to you and to me this morning? God's already told Habakkuk, don't misinterpret my patience with sinners as laxity towards sin. Here in Habakkuk 2.3, God promises that the day is coming when all sin and every sinner will be judged. The day is coming when every person will give an account for the way they have lived their lives, and for every evil they have perpetrated on this earth. God promises that the day is coming when He will right every wrong. The day is coming when He's going to execute perfect justice both in heaven and here on earth. And the question is, do we believe that? Really believe it? Do you believe that Jesus is coming again? Do you really believe that one day the books will be opened and every unbelieving man, unbelieving woman, unbelieving child will be judged according to what they have done? Do you believe that every unbeliever along with the demons and even Satan himself will be forever thrown out of the presence of God and into the lake of fire? Do you believe it? Do you believe that all who trust Christ as Lord and Savior will in fact live forever in a new heaven and a new earth where only righteousness dwells? Well, if you believe it, God says, wait for it. Wait for it. And as you wait by faith, God tells us the way to wait is by rejoicing in the presence of God, rejoicing in God no matter what your circumstances might be. Faith means believing God's promises. Faith means waiting patiently for God's justice. Faith means rejoicing in God's presence no matter what your circumstances might be. In chapter 1 of this book, the prophet Habakkuk is distressed by all the evil he sees. And he wonders how a holy God can let that kind of evil go on and on and on. And he questions God's justice. And he calls on God to act. And then in chapter 2, God does promise Habakkuk that the day of justice will come. And then he challenges Habakkuk 
to believe in that day and to wait for that day. How does Habakkuk respond? He starts out confused. He questions God. God answers him. How does Habakkuk respond to the answer he gets? In chapter 3, Habakkuk worships God. He responds to the word of God by worshiping God. That's what faith does. Believing in God's promise, he waits for God's justice, and as he waits, by faith, he rejoices in God's presence. If you haven't read this book this week, please go back and read it this week and slow down and read chapter 3 in the worship of Habakkuk. Now just let's look at two verses, verses 17 and 18. Because having heard from God, Habakkuk now sings from his heart, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. In other words, Lord, even though you strip everything away from me, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. As we read this, Let's not forget that Habakkuk's circumstances have not changed. Habakkuk is still surrounded by evil. The Babylonians are still coming to kill his people and burn Jerusalem to the ground. And so Habakkuk's circumstances have not changed. You know what has changed? His heart. His heart has changed. Habakkuk wrestled with God. Habakkuk prayed to God. And in his wrestling with God, in his praying through all these circumstances and all these things he didn't understand, in praying through those things and hearing from God, he comes out the other side with a deepened faith. And it was a faith that could rejoice in God no matter what his circumstances might be. It was a faith that rejoiced because he now understood that no matter what we might lose, God still remains. God still remains, and the promises of God still remain. The righteous shall live by his faith. The righteous shall live by her faith. And the faith by which we live is a faith that believes in God's promises. It is a faith that patiently waits for God's justice. And it's a faith that rejoices in God himself. Do you have that kind of faith? Do you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Through faith in Jesus through life with Jesus, have you become righteous with God? And are you continuing to become righteous with God day by day? By faith.